Hello and welcome to episode 22 of the Indie String Podcast. I'm your host, Kay, also known as Indie String and Ravelry, and I'm excited to be back to you. I hope you all had a wonderful week and a great weekend. And let's get started on what I have been knitting. So more of the same of what you saw last week, I've been knitting away on that blanket, the Hourglass Grow by Anne Hansen out of Lion Brand Woolies. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of the row. <clears throat> but anyways, look how big it's that. I'm going to have to kind of scroll up with you a little bit. So last week, over my head, I was... I was right here. So I knit all of that. Thing. As you know, I'm trying to bust the move on it to get it done. Um... The weather's been fluctuating here. It's been in about the 50s to 60s. And now that the blanket is past the 50% mark, it is weighing on me as I knit it. And each row, I have to adjust it at least once. And then when I go to the wrong side, I have to completely flip it around. So it's becoming more and more cumbersome, obviously, to figure it out. So I'm trying to kind of see my head. I have eight skeins to do this to be within the yardage requirements of the pattern. And I am on my fifth skein. And of that skein, let me get it for you, I'll show you. Uh, it's look at floppy. So I'm pretty sure I can get this through this tonight or definitely tomorrow. So my hope is that I only have two weeks more of knitting on this because you all have to be sick. Like, come on, how boring is it to see a born? I'm really happy with my progress this week, though. I felt awesome. Like, once I noticed how much I said, I was like, I got that. That's cool. But I felt invigorating with knitting this week. Really wanted to just go ahead, and I've been at home quite a bit this week as well. It was fabulous. Again, I still love the pattern, and I'm still really enjoying the knit. I have completely memorized um, the receipts by now. And it, it's quite quick after that point. And about the Lion Brand Woolies, I've never knit with it before. And it's an 80% acrylic and 20% wool. And I really like it. It's actually quite soft. And I can't wait to wash it and see um, the characteristics if it has any bloom. It just have a little skin. And um, you see if it softens up at all and how it all works out. So, still pushing ahead. Hopefully I can get that finished. In the next few weeks. It's a bad one. <laughs> I didn't on something else, but I forgot to bring it up, so I'm sorry about that, but I only got uh, like an done on it. When I was at um, gymnastics with my daughter, and every single time I go to gymnastics with my kid, so awful. I'm always like, okay, an hour smelling stinky feet. And so when I go in there, it's super active, quite big. And typically, there is 20 to 30 adults in there waiting for their kids or watching. Either they are staring blankly or they're on the phone. No one reads. And I am the only one that knits. And let me tell you, cray, cray look about my knitting. People just don't understand. Anyways, I have also seemed ahead this week. And I have worked on finishing up some of those works in progress that I had in the bin. So many of these works in progress, you guys may have seen one time or never seen it at all, and you have never seen this towel. So I started knitting this um, when I was on my hiatus. Let me try to get a good chance. And it's the shawl called Towel. And it is just this plain socket section. And it alternates between this one band of lace, sorry, the lighting is not well. This one band, stockinette section, three bands of the same left, lace, stockinette section. This is out of Madeline Tosh called Ren. It's a discounted base. I've had it for, I bet you've had the same again for four years. That's sad. But, um, it's out of the Oxblood colorway, which is actually one of my favorite colorways of hers. Um, 
And I've always wanted to make this towel since it first came out. I, I thought it was just the cutest thing. So uh, it is knit flat, and then you do a Kitchener stitch at the end to close it up. So what I did is I knit the whole thing, and then I had a provisional cast on. I put the live stitches on way too dark, and then I blocked it, and then I could convert it. Um, it was way easy for me. Way easier for me to block what is, in essence, a flat scarf, um, and then go back and do the Kitchener stitch. It made the Kitchener stitch much easier for me to do because where your Kitchener stitch is right here, and I'm going to show you. And I don't make socks, so it'll be nice to make It's about the best I can do. Um, it'll block out. I'm going to steam block it, but you do this. You're going to sock it next to a garter ridge here. Um, and in real life, it's actually not very noticeable at all, especially with the dark yarn. So you kitchener that up, and um, you make the loop. So let me put it on and show you how well it does. Very nice and light. Warm is a um, blend with merino wool. I think there's something else in it, but I don't, I don't remember. And it's really a nice double layer towel. Super, um, just perfect. It's like a perfect length for me. Um, in a one loop, it goes down to about um, right the top of okay, right, right below my button band. I'll say it like that. Below my button band, it sits about your hip length. But I really, really like it. Um, it's probably going to go in the gift bin. Me and my gift knitting, just trying to get ahead a little bit. Odd uh, thing is we talked about before, just telling people that I'll knit them something. So I'm trying to knit more classical, simple things that I'm not gonna, you know, cry if I give away. It was super quick. The instructions were very good. The lace pattern is really, really simple. I believe it does have rest rows, so you're only doing lace on one side and furling back. It was actually not bad. I really enjoyed it. I'll, I might knit another one for myself, but we'll see. I say that about everything, and then I just give it away, and I never make it for myself. My track record is awful. Awful. Okay. Sorry, I got like a frog in my throat today, so I'm drinking a lot more than normal. All right, so now we're going to talk about our feet. Ooh. No spinning this week. Sorry, I'll talk about that real quickly. No spinning, I'm still spinning the same thing. I almost got another third one. So, wow, that's boring too. Yeah. I need to le live a more exciting life. So, we're going to talk about sweaters again. Last week we talked about like parameters of how to choose your sweater. Um, someone made a comment in the RAV group. Great. Um, first time sweater uh, knitter. Many times people tell you to knit a top-down sweater with no seaming. Um, the reason why is because seaming adds another level of complexity to it, and um, bottom-up sweaters are, you do still have to do um, joining or seaming in those as well. And so the easiest construction type is a top-down. I like top-down sweaters. Um, I've knit many of them. Not they are easy. They're um, super intuitive. You understand where you are. You can see what you're doing. Um, and I would agree. They're great for a first-time sweater knitter. Basically, get the lay of the land. Understand some terms you haven't kind of heard before. And basic sweater construction. Overall, I don't necessarily feel as though they fit me personally the best. Um, I really like structure in my clothes. Um, or at least some kind of visual distraction, at least from my bad body part. And um, team sweaters, although easy to knit and very pretty, um, don't give the same kind of structure to a sweater that seems are seems are rig not rigid, but they're. If I have a seam right here, like I do on this this top. It creates a nice line, a nice visual 
um, about my sweaters. I want to make everyone look up. Um, my middle of my body, and I got a big derriere. I want them to look up, past my chest, to my neck, my collarbone, and my face. Um, and I find that it's easier to incorporate a lot of that sort of visual appeal into a structure or piece sweater. But I would not try to see sweater until you've at least knit one piece of sweater. But really what we're talking about this time is yarn. Hey, my favorite subject, right? So we're going to talk about yarn construction, um, choice of yarn, uh, and stash. Uh, how I determine what I'm going to stash and buy. So I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not an expert. This is my opinion. These are my biased um, opinions. And so take it or leave it. I'll try to impart as much as I can. So there's some very simple yarn constructions. And before, when I started knitting long ago, before Ravelry, before the days of Ravelry, um, I didn't know a lot of terminology. And I didn't really understand uh, the whole construction of a yarn um, until a few years later, when Ravelry came around, and there was kind of a freedom, of, more freedom, more access to information. It's easier to to find stuff in my own limited judge and viewpoint. And also, then my yarn construction understanding really put the science when I started spinning my own yarn. So the first kind of yarn type and where I'm going to be super general and I'm going to try to compare for you all fingering weights so you kind of uh, can see when I'm holding up single um, yarn. This is a single yarn. It means it doesn't have any other plies so I'll try to get it to focus on for you. And this is a fingering and it's Posh Merino Light from Madeline Posh. It is, as you can see, if I pull, it doesn't have a lot of um, Drawing or bounce to it, um, and it, it's a nice yarn. Um, it is strong. I mean, just because it's a single doesn't mean that it's not a strong yarn. It is strong, and these have been very popular in the last few years. And there's many sweaters in and out of these. So what would I tell you about a single yarn? A single yarn for me has some very good texture. It is lightweight. Um, because it doesn't have multiple flies, um, it seems to be and block out in a way that is attractive when you are trying to get something lightweight, maybe a summer garment or a nice light shell. Uh, it will stay where you put it. So, like a uh, sweater that has a ton of light detail and fingering, I would really consider this kind of single ply. In addition, single ply can be somewhat unforgiving in your knitting. And what I mean by that is where I'm really looking at is document. Most of the sweaters that I knit have a large document component. Now, they're maybe not all document, but there is at least 50% of it will be that kind of system. So, if I don't have very good tension, then, and that is when I'm knitting, that all my stitches, when I, I'm hand knitting, are not the exact same size. So maybe one stitch, you know, I'm watching TV for a while, and I'm getting distracted, and my stitches are bigger. And then I am really concentrating on this part because I have to use increases or decreases in this part of the pattern. So my stitches are a little bit tighter in uniform. Because of a single ply yarn, because of the construction and its characteristics, they're not going to hide that kind of inconsistency as well as a ply yarn. I think they won't hide it at all. Blocking will really help, um, but it's not going to be as forgiving. Um, I read one time, really struck a chord with me, think of a single ply yarn as kind of an oval yarn. It is round. However, it's not a circle. So you have, think of it when you're knitting, you have all these ovals lined up together. They're not going to give you the same kind of fabric as a plus. And for the first time ever, my daughter, you can see 
rounded, characteristically hot yarn. So when you're making more structural elements, that they'll stand out more than maybe a single wood. So really what I go up to next are three and four or five. And I kind of put them together because that's the majority of my stash. Uh, I really like a three five yarn. And I'll show you here. It is a very circular yarn. Um, and it has a, I mean, just, just a ton of bounce to it. When you're dealing with a three ply yarn, your stock in it, it's going to be pretty, um, in my opinion, in my experience, it's easy to get uh, a good tension, or at least after blocking a very even stock in it, as well as cables will really pop with this yarn. Um, and I find the versatility of a three ply really good. Now, on the opposite side of that, on um, large lace motif, may not look as good in a three ply yarn. Um, excuse me, I guess I'm All right, come back. Thanks for that momentary blip in uh, the video. Sorry about that. So, as I was saying, three ply yarn, yarn, yarn. Yard, maybe? I don't know where that came from. So three ply yard is my absolute favorite. Um, for me, and personally what I knit, it has the most versatility. Uh, it will not, I can't say that. There, there's nothing in absolute to knitting, right? Um, but it may not show lace as well as maybe a two ply yarn or a single yarn would, um, depending on the weight and the pattern. And so, I don't knit predominantly sweaters with lace or that are full lace. Um, I may have a small lace detail somewhere on my sweater, but since the predominant amount of my sweater is typically cable or socket knit, I tend to choose yarn that highlights those attributes the best, and that's what I tend to stash. Now let's talk about stashing. Oh, 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 you know what? One more thing for that. I have swatches. So, um, I'm going to show you some swatches and try to demonstrate some of the things that we were talking about. So, this is a single yarn and it is variegated, so it's going to be more difficult to see. Um, I chose a variegated single in this case. It was a pattern that called for a single yarn and I chose a variegated because it, a variegation, especially this is a pretty strong variegation for a sweater. I only have one or two sweaters that have this level of variation, but it helps hide some of my uneven stitches. Um, and it, you can't really tell great, but like this up here, the stitches are not the same size as these stitches over here. Um, and partially that's due to knitting, and partially that's due to this yarn. I'm going to show you some of the ends. Um, so these are the ends that are off. Do you see? I don't know how well you can see, but one I'm trying to look at it too, sorry. One of the yarns is thicker than the other. Not crazy thicker, but that slight variation is just enough to throw off the tension in my stitches to make it look like the stitches that are of, a, of the thicker part of the yarn much larger than the other part. The variation of this yarn really helps with that. And I don't think I've ever shown you guys these sweaters. Um, and I don't really wear it that much. That's what I'm doing. But that is a single. So, next up is a two ply. Again, you can notice that this has, although in the same color family, quite a bit of variation. And I, I chose it um, because far away, it, even up close, it seems like it has a lot of variation. But again, it's kind of catching those wonky stitches. You can somewhat see a little bit of the wonkiness in here. Um, the core variation is really throwing it off. But again, if I held this this square, it won't stay square. This is kind of um, the most, one of my most biggest disappointments in yarns that I purchased. The yarn itself by it one way. Politely this way, as you can see, you can see how it's almost like this side is curled up 
and it's kind of going over this way. Um, it's not a very balanced yarn, and uh, it was silk and merino, and the silk wasn't a great quality silk that they used in the blending process, and it was crunchy. And when I got the parts where it had a higher silk content, those stitches wouldn't knit at the same tension as the stitches that had more wool in them. And it, it's by it, the entire garment almost wants to buy a silver because it's not spun um, as well as maybe it could. I hate to I hate to say anything bad, but I want to be honest. I won't even say the dyer. They're not they're not in business anymore. So the second that I'm going to show you is another two ply. And this is Eco Wool. And this is one by one, one ribbing a while because it took so long. Could be Musa. Okay, so I had a, a lot of trouble with Eco Wool wool for me. This is on a pretty big gauge. And it's for a sweater for my husband that I didn't end up knitting because I didn't like my hair a whole bit. I didn't really like the fabric. Do you see how, like, look at how big that stitch is. Ridiculous. And over here, you see how that, like, my column is, like, zigzagging over? So, this is supposed to be a ribbed sweater. If I can't even get my swatch to lay flat, can you imagine an entire sweater with ribbing? If any of those columns aren't laying straight or they're wonky, it's going to be totally highlighted. So, he still really wants this sweater and bugs me about it all the time. But not really happy with the yarn choice. Um, I, I can knit it at a tighter gauge, and that's what I might do. I knit this swatch several years ago, so I, thought I need to re-swatch. I'm a better knitter than I was when I started it, and I probably need to go um, down a needle size or two to get a tighter fabric to eliminate some of that. But that is also the um, this is the the tension or the, the swatch, the knitting ratio that the ball band calls for. And just for me, it doesn't work. So other people that have different knitting styles, different tensions, that may work great for them. But personally, two plies, I have not had a wildly successful run or a single. So this is a sport rate. And this is where we're getting into three pie and above. And there's going to be an, a definite difference in the quality of the swatches. So this is a three ply sport, a size four needle. And I know it's black and it's hard to see, but very, very uniform. Perfectly so actually. The roundness of a three ply personally helps me my tension of ratio is a huge difference. And from further away, like if I show this to someone they would say it was machine knitted. I'm not saying I want to take away the hand knitting aspect of my yarn, but at the same time, I don't want someone to say, look at something I knitted, and be like, oh, that's so cool. I want them to be like, you made that? That's baller. That's awesome. Right? That's what everyone wants somebody's reaction to be. I want everyone to be like, you are awesome. And I'm so glad I'm getting this from so this is a three ply and a DK weight, and these are multiple dyers, multiple different bases. Most of them, um, actually, all of them have at least 50% wool content um, or 100%. So this is again very round yarn, nice and plump, even straight stitches. Um, and this is where I kind of get lost in my three ply. Um, so this is at recommended uh, tension or gauge, I should say, for this yarn. This is in a rayon weight, and it's all right. But if you can really see, there's only parts that you can kind of tell, like one over here, those stitches aren't as good as they could be. Um, and so, really, once I, I personally get up to this, um, a ran or a bulky and a three-ply, or really any yarn single, 
antipathy means to admit at a slightly sweeter gaze to get uh, an aesthetically pleasing fabric. Or at least aesthetically pleasing to me. Next, there's only two more. Who be the swatch party man? This is a swatch. This is a, we're going into four ply. Very similar to the three ply decay that I showed you. And again, the, the variation you're seeing is mainly due to color, not due to tension. Um, but very nice round fabric. Um, visually pleasing, soft in it, but if you turn it back a little bit, you can imagine the sweater. And lastly, the bigger swatch. This is a four ply as well. And what I really wanted to show you on this one is when I start talking about gaze, or that I tighten up my gaze. Down here, right here, and then it almost like looks looser. Down here, way down here, is a size four. And I was getting, um, my gaze was like tight. Or the pattern. So I was like, well, I'll switch to size sixes. And that's here. So see how those bees are almost a little bit bigger, and then up here is a size 5. So, if I measured my 5, 6 gauge, and my size 5, and the difference of the needles, the gauge is actually identical. But the look of a size 5, to me, is much better. My stitches are more even, the columns stack nicely next to each other, and this, for some reason, the size 6 is just a little bit off. It didn't really look right. So I actually knit it out of two size four and got a sweater for my sister. So partial, partially part of a pattern is going to be gauge how it looks. I really like a very, not dense fabric, but nice, neat, orderly fabric, I should say. So for me, I choose a yarn that is rounder when I am looking at staffing. The other thing that I look for staffing, other than for right, I have wool, I have BFL, I have blend um, for drape and some other things. Mainly I have workforces that are 100% super washed wool um, that are three pies or more. When I'm talking about color, really when you're looking at color, you're going to want to stay in a color palette that you feel comfortable with. Have a few kind of ones that are a little outside. And I think that's good to push your boundaries. Um, but remember your coloring. You know, I'm not going to wear something that draws me out or doesn't look really good on my coloring. I may love that color and want to knit. I may choose to knit gloves with that. But think of a sweater. A sweater is a huge investment. Stay in something that looks good on your skin tone. And that is a color you find pleasing. Also, I really deal with solid, tonal, semi-solid, or um, very low uh, variation. I have some, and I'll um, when we get to looking at what are funny that I have in my stash. Um, I have some that's gray with really light purple. Yes, is that two-tone yarn? Yes, variated variation. But when you knit it up, it'll be a slight variation of variation, so it won't look so dramatic. Um, more highly variegated yarn is really good, in my opinion, in accessories, baby blankets, some, some stuff. But a sweater on an adult of my age, I could potentially, depending upon the pattern and the yarn, look a little ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying don't have those. What I'm saying is most people, for the bulk of your stash, that's going to be, for a sweater stash, that's going to be a lower percentage. You're not going to have as many patterns that are really going to fit the bill for that kind of yarn. Um, while any pattern will look pretty good in a semi ballad So this is about stashing, not necessarily about picking yarn. Now, when you take yarn for a pattern, you know, and if you're going to go out and purchase it, hey, day. You know, if you want a very good crazy color, you go ahead. But most of my stash is, is deep. I mean, I'm routinely.
only knit with yarns I got five years ago. Many yarns that I can't get any more dyers and are no longer in business, I usually don't outright purchase yarn for a sweater project. And so because of that, really, I try to stay in a set of boundaries. Stuff that will remain to be plastic. Um, you know, browns, grays, purples. I mean, you know, co some colors come and go in their trends. Um, but, you know, a lot of stuff is just going to be hot now. So when I'm carrying yarn patterns, I would say be mindful of the elements of the pattern that you want to highlight. If I have an awesome cable detail, I'm going to want to take a rounder yarn that will make that cable pop. Probably in a semi-solid. If I have a variegated yarn that's lots of different colors and I have cables in it, the variegation in the yarn is going to distract from the cables and not make them as prominent. And unfortunately, you know, cables are a lot more work than stock in it. If I'm going to invest all of that time into doing a maybe a cable that runs up the side or an all-over cable pattern, I really want to be cleaned out. Now, of course, these are generalizations, and they're not always applicable, or you can make it work. I have seen awesome, awesome cables in variegated yarn. Um, the variegated yarn um, had a lot of similar color tones, and the cable motifs were very large, and they were all over the sweater. So I'm not saying that these are any absolutes, but just keep in mind what you will wear, your skin tone, the elements in your pattern, and the weight. Um, and, you know, just try to be kind to yourself and swatch. So we're done with sweaters. I don't have that much more time. I'm sorry. We're done with sweaters this week. We'll start to look through my my stack in a few a few weeks once we get to the the next part, which is going to the pattern. I'll I'll help you go through a pattern and, and I'll show you what I do to my patterns to make them easier to weave and spin. So we are on to the last two things enabling. I don't know if we'll get grant but we also got grants and raises. So, as we talked about a few weeks ago, I got into the Hello Yarn Fiber Club and I got my first shipment. So, I'm going to show it to you. This is EFL Silk and it is the February 2014 colorway called Village Smithy. And I love it. Of course I love it. It's the first one and it's awesome. So it's a gray, a dark gray, brown, and green. And I have two bumps. So, okay. That's my enabling this week. It's awesome. Um, I know that it's super hard to catch her updates, but she typically has two updates a month. Um, they are in the middle of the day, but she posts them on her group. And there is club colorways for extras, which you can't get unless you're in the club. But she does also have um, a wide assortment of dyes that are available for public purchase to anyone who can get there first. Uh, I would say get your ninja skills out if you want Hello Yarn in an update, but it is possible. So, yay! I'm so excited. I was like in, in a moment when I got it in the mail, right? It's like I never thought. It's so sought after. It's so hard to get in our club. It sometimes takes some people years to get in. I never thought I would get in a million years. <laughs> I thought it was just a pipe dream. So I'm, I'm super excited. All right, and then, oh gosh, I only have a few minutes, so I'll try to be quick. So I have a few good stories this week, but we'll talk about my cup. So this is my cup. I went with my girlfriend to a pottery place that was paint your own pottery. And so we showed up at 7 o'clock and they closed at 9, so two hours away. So we wanted to get time to paint our pottery. So we walk in, and seriously, this is the service. She goes, uh, you know, we close at 9. Goes, yeah, but it's 7. And so, she's like, yeah, I guess you can try if you really want, but you need to be done at 9. Because we close. I'm thinking, what a good way to start out with us. There's maybe 
there was less than 10 other people in there. Let's just say that. It wasn't like it was stacked and there were booming. And they didn't have a table for us. There was hardly anyone in there. And of the 10 people, um, after we got there, 10 minutes after we got there, two groups finished up. And so there was us, which was just me and my girlfriend, and then a group of four. And that was it. The place was dead for the next two hours. So I picked this out, and I painted it in my Indie Spring um, logo colors, which is the orange and the gray. And I, I, I'm really happy with that. I totally love it. Uh, you can't really tell. I ended up getting green paint on my finger, so like there's green paint on the handle. And she was kind of right, although rude in her way of going about it, that at like 8.30, she's like, okay, well, you need to stay finish up and uh, clean up your table and uh, we're starting to close. So I really um, didn't do as good of a job as I wish I would have done on some of the stripes. Like, I'm showing my flaws. See, like right there, there's this horn. That's in the um, gray stripes. But I do really love it so much that um, we talked about going back and I might take another one so I have a set. And hopefully they're not so um, rude. So I will show up before 7. She was right in a roundabout way. She didn't have to be so rude about it. Um, so that's the end of this episode. I'll save my other rants and rants for another time. I just, you know, customer service is, for some people, going by the wayside. And it's ridiculous. Customer service should be one of the most important things in your business, especially a retail business. You know, I don't know why it's happening, but I was raised, and I think many of us were raised, well, you know, you treat others the way you want to be treated. And that is not just a thing for little kids. It's a thing for everybody. And I like to try to show people as much respect as possible and put a smile on their face because you never know if someone's having a bad day. You never know what the situation is. I really try to reserve my judgment and my tongue, <laughs> and keep it to myself. You don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all, and, you know, treat people kindly. And as I get older, if I'm encountering more and more people, it's like 50 50, you know. I, a lot of times, feel, you know, how hard of it would have, would have been for her, excuse me, to have said to two customers, Really glad you're in here. Just wanted to let you know it usually takes people about two hours. We're closing at nine. You need to start to clean up two minutes early, so you need to be a little tight. So, you know, we're happy to have you. Just wanted to, you know, let you know what's going on. You know, I, good thing we picked cups, and I didn't pick those two gigantic things. Here, so stuff bigger than my head. Sorry, didn't mean to get interrupted. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. <laughs> no transition. Have a wonderful week and get with a lot of smoking. Bye, everyone.